hey, you want to play Navajo Wars, but you don't even have it, and you're not sure if you should get it? Or maybe you have it, and you even know how to play, but you're just not sure what to do on your turn. Well, we're going to do a playthrough today of Scenario 2, so that you can watch me play and hopefully get a sense of how this works and where the fun is. Uh, I really enjoy this game. I've been playing it a fair amount lately. I'm by no means an expert, but I do think I know enough to, uh, to do a video to show you some of the implications of uh, the decisions that you have and where the fun is in the game. So we're going to play Scenario 2, uh, what's it called? Los Dueños del Mundo. Excuse my Spanish, I speak French, but uh, the Lords of the Earth, and it covers the Spanish period of the Navajo people history. So we're going to play through that today. I'm going to do a brief uh, overview or intro here, holding the camera, then I will fix it, and we can play. Uh, now, I, the, the intention of this video is not to do a how to play. That would be something else. I suggest that you watch the brief um, how to play video that the designer did. It's only like 15, 16 minutes long. At the same time, I will put a, an overview of the turn structure on the screen so that maybe if you don't want to go watch a video maybe you can familiarize yourself with the turn structure and be able to follow along. Before I do that however let's go over what we have here on the board. Uh, we are playing the Spanish they are yellow so yellow pieces are bad so uh, and, and brown is, uh, is good for us so that's our culture we start with nine culture we start with five military points um, and five enemy morale, five enemy ferocity. We start with three action points. And the movement points, which is what you use for um, family actions. So we have action points and then movement points. Movement points are pretty much, though, action points for the family. Uh, they can be used to move or take actions. And then we have enemy action points. I like to track them on this track here. So I'll be moving this uh, up and down during the game to track enemy movement points. Uh, we have counters out of play over here. <clears throat> Our families A, B, and C are represented right, right here. And then I've also started them on the board in the allowable starting positions. All right, we've got one in Shiprock, one in San Juan Valley, and one in the Canyon de Chez. Over here, is one of the highlights of the game if you're not familiar with it. This is the enemy instruction display. This is the <clears throat> the engine for the enemy AI. And we have an active column and a standby column. The active column is the one you really got to worry about. Those are the the actions that the enemy is going to take in top-down order. Um, now before that happens, however, we're going to roll some dice and some of these could flip or they could swap with the corresponding one on the standby track. So you're not 100% sure what the enemy is going to do. Each game, you randomly remove two. So we lost counters D and J here, as you can see. All right, so those guys are out of the game. Then we have some other enemy counters up here. These are action point trackers. As I mentioned, I like to use the track over uh, that I showed you. I will use these for enemy raids, as you will see, and then I will use these counters. Those are the tribal raid counters, so I'll use those for tribal raids, and then we have Spanish outposts, and they're going to be plopping those out on the board, and I'm going to have to stomp on them as soon as they do that. Per the instructions, we get to start with one cultural development card. I'm a big fan of the Cunning family, so I have chosen this as my starting one. Um, if I have uh, one or more culture points, I may exhaust this card in order, so you know, tap it, uh, to have an enemy, <clears throat> to have the enemy skip one of these instructions. That can come in handy, and then I like level two and three even better, as you will see. These ones are out of play, so they're upside down. I had to remove randomly um, three, let's see if I can do this here, three sets. And uh, unfortunately, these are three that I really like, Horsemanship, Religion, and Weaving. All three of these sets were randomly removed this game, so I will not have access to those. 
Oh, of course, we also have the deck for this game. The deck is built per the, the instruction, the scenario instructions. We've got five stacks of operations and ceremony cards, and within those stacks, one historical event is shuffled into each of the stacks. And if you're not familiar, when those come up, we'll have a scoring round, or the option for a scoring round, or a penalty if you don't choose to have the scoring round. So we build our deck by putting each of these on top, and then when the last one comes out in that last set, that will be the end of the game at that point. Okay, so a turn is made up of three major phases. Card draw phase, card resolution phase, discard phase. First you draw a card, duh. Then, in the resolution phase, if it's an operations card, which it will be most of the time, we'll have a normal turn. A normal turn consists of an enemy operations phase first, followed by a player operations phase. Unless we choose to preempt the enemy by paying a certain number of action points as indicated by the card. Sometimes, though, we won't have any action points and we won't even have that choice. In either case, both the enemy operations phase and player operations phase have to happen before we then resolve the major and minor events. If it's a non-ops card, which in this scenario would be either a ceremony card or an historical event, we will resolve them per the, the indications on the card. Then we'll go into the discard phase where the card will either be discarded or left on the board for a permanent effect as instructed by the card.